Welcome to the introduction to Real Options Analysis of Primer, brought to you by Real Options Valuation Inc., the makers of Real Options Super Lattice Solver and Risk Simulator software. They're applicable for Real Options Analysis, Risk Analysis, Monte Carlo Simulation, Forecasting Optimization, and General Statistical Analysis. The agenda for today starts off with the new paradigm of Real Options, specifically looking at what, where, who, when, how, and why of Real Options. That is, Half the challenge of real options, or 50% of it, is just thinking about it and understanding the theory of real options. Another 25% comes from actually performing the analysis and obtaining credible results, while the remaining 25% of the challenge of real options is the ability to explain it to yourself, to senior management, to your client, and to the person sitting next to you. Otherwise, showing you the software will probably take me about 5 to 10 minutes, which means that the software and the results will still remain a black box. We then continue the presentation by looking at several actual business cases I've consulted for personally to see how real options can be used in the industry. We will then finish the presentation by looking at the real options super lattice software, risk simulator software, and present to you the training seminars, training DVDs, CRA certification programs, the certified risk analyst program, and consulting services that we provide at the company. By way of introduction, I am Dr. Jonathan Munn the founder and CEO of Real Options Valuation Inc. I'm the author of seven books, including Real Options Analysis, first and second editions, Real Options Course, um, Applied Risk Analysis and Modeling Risk, first and second editions, Valuing Employee Stock Options, and others. I'm also the creator of the older version of Real Options Analysis Toolkit and the newer Real Options Super Lattice Solver, which you will see, and the Risk Simulator software. Now let's just jump into the Real Options Analysis and see what it's all about. There's um, <clears throat> been a lot of buzz in the industry on real options lately. For instance, several Harvard Business Review articles back in 1998 and even as recent as 2004 and 5 state that real options is the next big thing. In fact, Business Week calls it the next major business breakthrough and Industry Week calls it a better approach to valuing flexibility. So, what is this real options? Why is it better or is it better? Um, who has used it, how is it used, and what industry characteristics are most amenable to using real options. Well, first off, here's my textbook definition of real options analysis. It is an integrated risk analysis approach. The key takeaway from this slide is that real options is not an equation or set of equations. That is, real options is not A plus B equals C, where C is some magical option value. So instead, real options is an analytical process that combines the best practices of finance, economics, decision analysis, options theory, and statistics, and is applicable in all industries with uncertainty and risk, but as strategic flexibility or strategic options. So why do we care about real options analysis? Well, the top right picture um, on your screen is analogous to the traditional analysis, such as the discounted cash flow or um, net present value return on investment approaches. It shows that going from points A to B, it is a straight line. That is, if benefits outweigh the cost of executing a project, then do it, i.e. your NPV is positive, otherwise don't do it when NPV is negative. This is clearly a very short-sighted and very myopic view of things. The bottom right picture is analogous to real options analysis, where going from point A to B, there are a lot of uncertainties. This picture reminds me of a seminar I, I gave recently in Tokyo, where when I traveled from Narita Airport to downtown Tokyo, there were many road signs with convoluted pathways and with red and green lines and so forth, indicating traffic conditions. So if you have multiple strategic options, that is, in this case, the ability to make a left, to make a right, or make a U-turn, how much is that strategic roadmap and the strategic flexibility to make a left, right, or U-turn worth to you? Now, rather than succumbing to risk and uncertainty and not knowing if there will be congestion and having the strategic option to make left and right you know, turns is actually worth a lot. So that is the essence of real options analysis. Now, let's spend some time on example business cases to understand how real options is used in the industry. These are based on actual consulting work I've done personally throughout the years, although the numbers and stories have been <clears throat> tweaked slightly to protect the innocent, if you will. For example, Boeing takes oh, about seven years and about up to uh, seven billion dollars to develop the next 787 jetliner. Imagine if you would, what would happen if the wrong prototype was developed? Airbus could come in and pulverize them. Boeing faces two major sources of risk, specifically the market risk, that is, the economic conditions and competitive landscapes, um, what it will be years from now, and private risk if the plane will actually take off. 
so the R&D type risk. So Boeing uses an option to abandon and switching option, so abandonment option and switching option to hedge the risks. That is, they perform parallel development with five simultaneous prototypes. So as uncertainty and risk become known over time, events, and action, they can, or Boeing can actually abandon one prototype, reallocate its resources to the other four, three, two, eventually the one, thereby mitigating the downside risk of picking the wrong prototype. Now, Airbus in Toulouse, France, heard that I was doing some work, uh, real options work with Boeing, and wanted to know how they can apply real options. And Airbus was interested in hedging the market side of the risk, if you will. That is, Airbus sells the, say, uh, A340s in the primary market to airlines like uh, SAS, United, Continental, um, say for 50 million euros. However, SAS takes a lot of risk by purchasing that aircraft now from Airbus for delivery, say, a few years into the, in the future, as the economic conditions and competitive landscapes are unknown in the future. If bad conditions occur, SAS may have to reshuffle and reallocate its portfolio of planes, or even sell some of its planes in the secondary market, where smaller airlines like JetBlue or AirAsia would purchase. The problem is, the prices in the secondary market is highly volatile, fluctuate significantly with a lot of risk, and the value of the plane is unknown or will be unknown. So if Airbus can provide an option to abandon, an abandonment option for SAS, whereby, for example, Airbus agrees to buy back the plane within a, say, five-year period at a guaranteed residual buyback value of 30 million euros. What Airbus has done is provide a safety net of sorts, an insurance policy, where the price of the plane will never be below 30 million euros in the secondary market. So if the secondary market's price is, say, 35 million, what SAS could do is it can sell it in a market, but if it is below that 30 million threshold, sell it back to Airbus. So how much is this safety net or option to abandon worth to SAS? Think of a normal distribution with its left tail as the risky side of things. Imagine now we take a knife and cut off the left tail, as in the Airbus case. The price of the aircraft will never be below 30 million. So the width of the distribution decreases because you're cutting off the left tail, creating risk mitigation, you're reducing risk. At the same time, when you chop off the left tail, the expected value, the average of the distribution shifts to the right, so indicating a value enhancement. This is, again, the essence of real options, creating value enhancement and risk reduction in this case. Um, next, another example would be BP. BP's deep sea drilling project called Atlantis several years ago cost several billion dollars, about two, three billion dollars to run. Clearly, BP faces two major sources of risk, the market risk of highly volatile oil prices and also the private risk of the size of the reservoir, the pressure of the reservoir, the porosity, of the soil, you know, uh, caps, and other unknown geological structures and features. So BP obtains the option to contract or contraction option and the option to expand or an expansion option to mitigate the downside and capture the upside. The option to expand is to develop a slightly larger platform than required originally, which will be sitting idle until the time when the price of oil is so high that the expansion option is executed and the facility expansion is implemented and additional wells are drilled on that additional uh, slightly larger platform to generate a higher production and hence capture the upside. Or even if production rates are low, they're not getting as much oil as they would like to, these new wells can be made into injectors rather than uh, ejectors where you pump things out, you're pumping gas or water inside to increase the rate um, of the reservoir, uh, to increase the pressure of the reservoir and generate a higher production rate. So the question is, how large does this additional facility need to be and is it worth it? Should you spend that extra X amount of millions of dollars to have this facility expansion, this expansion option? What is the value of having such an expansion option? <clears throat> Conversely, um, BP can actually execute or create an option to contract um, by, for example, finding a counterparty such that if all prices in the market are moderate, this counterparty will take over all operations and cost of running the rig take over. So BP can send all of his engineers home, saving on the operating costs year after year. At the same time, the counterparty <clears throat> will get 49, say 49 percent of the revenues, and BP will keep 51 percent of the revenues generated in, in the future. This is great for BP because, you know, if all prices are only moderate, what BP can do is he can redeploy his resources elsewhere and cut costs and do something else, but still <clears throat> hang on to the part of the revenues, you know, in this case 51%. Well, the counterparty 
um, BHP, say a smaller entity, gets to use the rig without spending a dime on development costs, which uh, BP has already spent billions of dollars on. And this smaller counterparty can still obtain some revenues. So it is a win-win situation. And the whole idea is, <clears throat> what is an optimal you know, contraction percentage? Is it 51%, 49%, you know, 75%? And how much is this option worth? So real options will actually provide that for you. Um, <clears throat> another example would be, say, Seagate. In the process of uh, you know, developing a, a new hard drive, Seagate is trying to create a, a super compact and super small and super high density um, hard drive, which means that it is extremely difficult to do so. And it will take maybe five years and four to five years and say about $40 million in R&D costs to develop this new hard drive with a lot of, of risk of uh, whether or not this will be successful. <clears throat> it has identified um, a smaller startup that already has, say, 75% of the technology completed. But it's asking, this startup is asking for $50 million to be acquired. So Seagate is thinking, well, do we build or do we buy? You know, purchasing is $50 million, building yourselves is $40 million. In an NPV, in that present value world, it is better to develop it themselves because it's cheaper. However, in the real options world, acquiring this startup has a lot of options. First, it takes the startup out of the market and prevents Seagate's competitors, um, <clears throat> say Western Digital, MaxTor, and so forth, from getting their hands on the technology. Next, Seagate should not value the firm, this startup firm, based on the straight line DCF model, in this case, $40 million, you know, the cost. Instead, the firm can either be successful or fail. Now, if it fails, Seagate can still execute an abandonment option and sell the company's assets and intellectual property and so forth, thereby not really lose the entire $50 million purchase price. Maybe they can get back five, ten, twenty million million, $20 million in residual salvage value of selling the company. On the other hand, if the company, if this startup company is successful, Seagate can put some extra funds into the company to create spin-off products. For instance, put an interface around a hard drive and now you have an MP3 player. Stick it in a, in a television set and now you have a high-density personal video recorder. Put it in a car and now you have a GPS system with a high-capacity memory and a million other applications, which you cannot have unless you have this hard drive. So it's a sequential option, phase one, phase two. You cannot go to these phase two spin-off products without having phase one products. However, you would not have this option if you were to spend four to five years to develop this product. Because if you were to purchase this company, it's 75% there. Your development time is maybe truncated to half a year or one year. So if Seagate does not view its downstream options by acquiring this firm, the option to expand, option to you know, abandon, and so forth, it will greatly, greatly underestimate the true value of this company to Seagate. So Seagate should not value this company per se in fair market value terms, but Seagate should value this company, this startup, as though you know it's part of Seagate. So in other words, what is this company worth to Seagate, not how much is this company worth, period. Okay? Because by bringing it into Seagate, Seagate is now creating a lot more options. Now, in contrast, if the startup does not look at the options and brings to Seagate, it may or may not leave some money on the negotiation table because this company is worth a heck of a lot more than $50 million. Next, the pharmaceutical industry. That is actually a, the best textbook example of real options. All the drugs developed have to go through a multi-staged uh, process, it's a sequential compound option, a phase one, phase two, phase three, before you go for FDA, you know, Food and Drug Administration approval, at least in the U.S. These are stage gate sequential options. You cannot go to two without first passing one. Each phase is an option whether or not to continue. And other applications include whether or not to fast track the development of a product to phase three versus continue on with an intermediate product in phase two. Same situations applies for uh, research and development, say Motorola, uh, R&D portfolios. They've got phase one or M gate one, Motorola gate one, Motorola gate two, and M gate three, M gate four, and so forth. All these different stage gates are options. Whether or not they should be expanded, contracted, abandoned, pull the plug, and so forth. Finally, uh, peaking plans. Prices of electricity, if you ever lived in California, um, back probably in the year 2002 to 2003, are highly volatile. You know, prices can actually double or triple even. So how much is it worth to a power plant to build a secondary yet inefficient peaking plant? So if it's inefficient, it'd be, it is very cheap, up on a hill somewhere, where for the next, uh, say, 360 days, is, it remains shut but for five days in a year when electricity prices are extremely high. 
has someone climb up the hill and turn on a switch and capture the additional upside, capture the additional revenue by generating additional uh, electricity. So how much is this option to execute worth, an execution option, option to wait? So how much should we spend on building this plan? Is it worth it? I mean, I can go on and on about more business cases and, and so forth, and we can spend hours on this. That is literally what I do um, in class, and we do hands-on exercises and so forth. But might I suggest, if you're interested, to uh, read one of my books called uh, Real Options Analysis, Tools and Techniques, um, second edition. Please get the second edition because it has all the updated cases and so forth and uh, the use of the new software. It's published by Wiley Finance in the year 2005 and you can actually obtain it on Amazon.com. Um, you can get more detailed business cases and industry cases in oil and gas, pharmaceutical, biotech, real estate, manufacturing, M&A, mergers acquisition, telecommunications, venture capitalists, even in the U.S. military, how it's used in the uh, United States Navy and Department of Defense. So, you know, feel free to actually uh, explore a little bit more. But hopefully at this point, you are aware of uh, how real options are being used in the industry. So, how do, you, how do you do this real options thing? Well, here's an integrated risk analysis process. Real options, again, is not a standalone analysis. It's not A plus B equals C, but it's a process. So here is the process. It's an eight-step pro integrated process, if you will. The output of a, the, the key takeaway here is steps uh, three, four, and five, and six, where the output of the discounted cash flow model becomes the input into a real options analysis. So in other words, you use a DCF before you apply real options. In other words, use what is tried and true. Do not you know, throw out your discounted cash flow NPV analysis and replace it with real options. No, real options relies on your traditional NPV DCF analysis. So keep what is tried and true, but improve upon it, push the envelope, and make it better. That's all. So the process starts, for example, with a series of projects, you know, A to E in this case, in step one, whether they are different assets or strategies. And these things hopefully have passed through qualitative screening. <clears throat> Um, next, each project or assets cost of revenues are forecasted. You can use risk simulators forecaster uh, for this, and you will model this in a discounted cash flow or some sort of Excel model, for example, in step three. This is where traditional analysis stops. You may tweak and do some sensitivity and scenario analysis, but traditional analysis stops right there. Now, all I'm saying is take it to the next step. Here we push the envelope and take it to uh, Monte Carlo simulation in step four. So that is risk analysis. That's the beginning of risk analysis. So instead of relying on single point estimates, so you know single points, single numbers in your model, we apply risk simulator, uh, the software which you will see, and simulate the uncertainties and risk in the model thousands of times. The results will be distributions of outcomes or forecasts and a measure of volatility, which is a measure of risk and uncertainty. Then the strategic options are being framed in step five. In other words, we find the strategic options or create options or, or purchase options to mitigate the downside risk that we talked about and take advantage of the upside, like in the business cases. And then these options are valued using the real options super lattice software, the SLS, um, in step six. Now in step seven, that's actually an optional step to use risk simulator for portfolio optimization. If there are multiple, say, interacting projects, uh, these projects can be put into a, a portfolio and optimized. So you're trying to maximize the profitability of the portfolio itself to select the best projects or allocate resources um, across the chosen projects subject to time or resources or budget constraints. Finally, the results are presented um, in step eight and the analysis is rerun again in the future, you know, three months, six months, a year from now, when the uncertainties and risks become resolved and known over the passage of time, actions, and events. This is a key step in step eight, as real options and risk analysis assumes strategic flexibility and uncertainties. So when these uncertainties become known over time, the analysis will need to be updated frequently. So now that you have an idea of real options, well, be careful, because do not apply real options everywhere. Okay? Only apply it appropriately, of course. There are actually five requirements for applying real options. First, there must be uncertainty. Otherwise, the traditional discounted cash flow MPV analysis will work perfectly as the options value is zero when uncertainty or volatility equals zero. 
and the real options analysis will revert back to the NPV value. So NPV is perfect because remember going from point A to point B, if there are no convoluted pathways, if everything is known in advance, well, if benefits outweigh costs, do it already. Forget about any additional analysis. So there must be uncertainty before you can actually apply or think about real options. Um, second, these uncertainties and risk must affect the decisions or the outcomes of the project. So certain things occurring in the uncertainty world um, will force you to make a left, make a right, make a U-turn, and so forth. Third, you must be able to construct a model such as a DCF, a traditional analysis, a net present value. Uh, because the traditional DCF NPV analysis is a required prerequisite for real options modeling. The fourth requirement is that there must be strategic options and flexibility. Otherwise, do not apply real options analysis when there are no options, indeed. And finally, the fifth uh, requirement is such that management must be smart enough, incredible enough to execute the strategic options when they become optimal to do so. So otherwise, all the options in the world become useless. Okay? So you need to understand some of these uh, caveats and, and requirements and so forth. Now, here is a, a quick intuition of straight line DCF analysis. You're making an assumption of year one, two, three, four, five, whatever the values are, cash flows, and you would draw this straight line, whether it's jaggered or sloping down, upwards, and so forth. And this is assuming zero uncertainty, zero volatility, single point estimate is sufficient. The next slide shows the uncertainty in the projected values. This is more reality, if you will. The higher the volatility, in this case 20% versus uh, 5%, you would see that the higher the volatility, the higher the risk, the higher the uncertainty. So we can capture and model these uncertainties using Monte Carlo simulation, which is in step four in the process, if you will. Now, just modeling these uncertainties is very important to capture the risk. However, what is next? Well, what next is to say, what if things are higher up or lower down? And what this does is literally, you know, real options analysis tells you how to capture the upside swings. For example, expansion option, option to execute, switching options, and so forth. Um, and also, if things are not looking well, um, you can actually ex execute things like abandonment option to mitigate the downside risk in this case. That is the value of real options. But before you can actually do real options analysis, you need Monte Carlo simulation because you need to forecast where things will go, if that makes sense. Um, Here's a uh, quick couple of slides telling you the global acceptances. You know, some of the companies and universities, I've, you know, professors and so forth that I've trained who are using my software, using my books, or uh, companies that I've done consulting work for, including MIT, New York University, University of Pennsylvania, Warren Business School, and universities around the world. Um, and also, you know, different corporations here that I've actually trained and have uh, done consulting work for, such as BP, Boeing, Cargill, um, Bristol Myers, Conoco, uh, Eli Lilly, and so forth and so on. Johnson and Johnson, Pharmaceutical, Pfizer, uh, Pacific Gas, Electric, um, GE Capital. GE is a, actually a major user of risk analysis in this case. Stories Tech, Seagate Technologies, Renaissance, um, Syngenta in Switzerland, and so forth. And finally. Our company actually um, offers several products and services, including the Real Options Super Lattice Solver software, also known as the Real Options SLS for short, which you can actually get um, you know, a live demo for in a, a different segment of uh, the presentation. We also have uh, the Risk Simulator software used for running Monte Carlo simulation, forecasting, optimization, and general statistical analysis. We also offer a one to four day course and seminars on risk analysis, real options, forecasting, optimization, and modeling, which I teach personally, and also one of my partners, several of my partners. Completion of these courses, uh, certain you know prerequisites, of course, allows you to obtain the CRA or Certified Risk and Analyst credential. Please visit our, our website for more details on the CRA certification. We also have uh, a set of eight training DVDs, uh, similar to what you're seeing right now. Um, of the courses and seminars where it's a little bit more hands-on training using the software and so forth for those people who cannot really make it for the uh, live courses that we have around the world um, in different you know, times around the world. Finally, we also provide uh, professional consulting services. So feel free to contact us for more information or visit our website at www.realoptionsvaluation.com that's with an S, so realoptionsvaluation.com In the next segment, you will be able to view uh, the risk simulator and real options super lattice solver in action and see a live uh, movie demo of these software applications hands-on. 
thanks for your, your time and participating in this uh, little presentation. And feel free to visit our website to get additional inform updated information on course schedules and certifications and so forth. Thank you.